I'm Louis Servin. I am currently working for Hepakloith, a shipping company in Germany. I was working before uh, for an automotive car manufacturer and for a wind uh, turbine uh, manufacturer, all of them in Germany. I had the pleasure of leading the security practice at the car manufacturer for about eight years. And that led me to teaching a lot of colleagues and suppliers into how we wanted to do threat modeling. It also gave me the possibility to receive a lot of threat models from the organization that passed through my desk to give them a, a rating and see if they were okay. And that allowed me to identify a lot of problems practitioners had when they were starting. And in that sense, I have come up with this concept of the katas, which is something I was working on um, at the car manufacturer, but which I have been perfecting a little bit over, over time. And the concept behind the kata is um, basically kata comes from the Japanese word uh, form. It has two different kanjis, both mean form. I'm not exactly sure what makes one or the other better. better. And the idea is not mine. I stole it from Neil Ford and Neil Ford stole it in turn from someone else. Uh, the idea is it, it started with code katas, then with architectural katas. And I'm just basically taking the architectural katas and transforming them into uh, threat modeling katas. A kata in karate, this martial art, is a, a choreographed pattern of movements practiced alone in isolation. And uh, the idea is you create muscle memory out of them. You can work on perfecting a punch, a defensive technique, a kick, turns in, in a zero uh, stakes environment. And that's exactly what we want to achieve with, with a, a kata on threat modeling. So in that sense, we're going to go through a quick kata today. Um, officially, we have one hour. <clears throat> but I'm open to stay a bit longer if you have the time and if you need more more time. So in general, this is how it will look like. We'll have a bit of presentation, short exercise, bit of presentation, short exercise, and then show results. That's the that's whole idea. We will be working with Miro. I'll share the link for the Miro board later. That, just let me get to that point. In general, threat modeling is a four-step process. Um, you model the system, which means you understand the system, its scope, its actors, interactors, and then you validate the model with the owners of the model, the developers of the system. You analyze what can go wrong. That means you find vulnerabilities, you try to apply threats on them, and you can help yourself with any number of threat libraries, Stride, Linden, I'll mention uh, MLSEC in there's a GitHub uh, repository called M MLSEC uh, EOP, which is basically the same concept um, as, as the EOP, Elevation of Privilege from um, Shostak. Then the third step is, of course, to do mitigation. What can I do now that I know what can go wrong? And the last step, which is basically just a feedback loop, is everything okay in what I did? So far, nothing scandalous about this. Now, where should we be looking at when we're threat modeling? First of all, in, in, the modeling, uh, in the modeling phase, we need to be able to approach the target of evaluation systematically. And the one thing I have realized in, in my experience is if I am with a group of people, everyone has a different background usually, which means they have different perspectives and they have different starting points. And it's sometimes interesting to see how other people approach the system, but it's also necessary to not lose sight of the forest because of the trees. Meaning sometimes we laser focus so much on one screen. Sometimes uh, when, I'm, when I'm threat modeling, I am shown like the screens through which the system goes. And even though that's interesting, that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for more 
at a conceptual level what the connections are the different microservices services third-party systems that might be interacting rather than which fields make up whatever uh, screen or or api in the analysis phase we look uh, we will look up uh, on on a framework of methods you can think of it as tools in the belt if you only have a hammer every problem looks like a like a nail but if you have different tools different approaches then you can approach look for some point of contact that will give you leverage to find and improve on on on, on your threat models um I like to work with different threat elicitation models or methods, which for me means Stride is not threat modeling. Stride is one common threat modeling or threat library. It is not threat modeling. Um, look for vulnerabilities to validate the threats. If there is no vulnerability to which this threat applies, then there's no threat. And uh, we'll talk about credible attack vectors later. And finally, um, when you mitigate, um, you have to address the vulnerability or the threat scenario. So basically, if, if we translate this into the CSF framework, the cybersecurity framework format, addressing the vulnerability is identifying and protecting the system. And uh, addressing the threat scenario is a lot more about detection, response, and recovery. So let's start with modeling the system. Very often, in, in my experience, you're faced with something that looks like this. Either the pet shop uh, example from OWASP on the right-hand side, or a firewall placement diagram, as I like to call them, on the left-hand side. And actually, what do any one of these diagrams tell me? Not much. There's, there's not much information I can gain from just looking at these things. I mean, that they're that on the left hand side that we have communication over TCP and these ports doesn't really tell me anything about the system. It doesn't help me at all uh, get anywhere with my practice. Let me open the chat on the side. Uh, forgot to mention if you have any questions, feel free to chat in. I'm just trying to see the chat window. Pardon. All right, sorry. I have the chat window open, sorry for that. Um, and on the right-hand side, I mean, we have a pet shop, we have a pet shop customer, the admin, the anonymous user, it's not bad. But then it comes to the level of detail. Is the pet shop one thing? Are we modeling just the server? Or are we modeling just one service? What about the database? What about... Um, these new React or Angular frontends, which are just static files, which you download on the beginning, and then you interact with an API, that is obviously not seen here. So the level at which we do this is, is very important. And then the opposite extreme is when you have so much information that you just get lost. And it is not uncommon if you have ever used a threat modeling tool from Microsoft to have something that looks like this. It just gets wild. And if you look at this, you will have 400 findings in the threat modeling tool or more even. And yeah, it's nice you have all of these, but it deal, it leads to a big problem, which is as a security practitioner, are you recreating the diagrams that the developers already created where the diagrams you started with up to date or the diagrams uh, in a current state? And who will keep your diagram up to date if you're using a different tool than the, than the developers or a different diagramming methodology than the developers? And, and then there, there's this, this uh, challenge of abstraction annotation. So how do we abstract the system? How do we annotate the system so that it makes sense for everyone? And looking a lot through this, I not go. It, I found the, the C4 model a few years back. And the C4 model stands because, uh, for four times C, context, 
containers, not Docker containers, but deployable units, components, and code. And in threat modeling, I always try to get to the red line, context diagram and container view. These are two different views. I'll explain that in detail. Component and uh, classes or code directly, I hardly ever get that far, except for extremely sensitive things when I have the impression that the developers might be storing passwords in a non-hashed form because of the answers they provided before, I might go and actually look at the code, but I hardly ever look at that far. And in that sense, we can think of diagramming in the same way as we think of Google Maps. You start, when you start looking, if you start planning your vacations in Europe and you're not from Europe, the first thing, the thing you start with is, okay, let's start with Europe. Where is Europe? Which country do I want to visit? Oh, I want to visit uh, England. Oh, okay. And in England, there's an island in the in the channel and this, it's the, the Isle of um, Wild or any, any other one. And then this, this is a particular street in it. So basically we start with our system in the center and imagine you double click on it and it opens up. And it shows you the deployable units you have inside of it. And if you choose any one of these deployable units, obviously the most valuable of them, it will open up and give you more information about them. Or put in a different context, if we start with the most important thing in the center, our target of evaluation, and we zoom in, we see, we see um, the different technology choices that we made. And if we choose one in particular, for example, this, this yellow one, then we can see the different uh, components that make it up. And we could even zoom into one to see the classes, but of course, that would be the line where we stop. We stop somewhere around there. There's no need to go a lot deeper than that. Coming close to the, to the end of this first um, part of the presentation, there are very few simple principles here. Um, start with simple boxes. Don't complicate your life. <laughs> Name the system. Describe the element type. Give a short description of what the thing does. And when you have a relationship to another thing, label it. The intention, not so much the protocol. Yes, write the protocol, HTTPS, something else. But it's a lot more important for threat modeling to understand the intention that rather than just HTTP or HTTPS. Put the most important thing in the middle. TCP is bidirectional. But TCP always starts and you get an answer acknowledging the message. The back channel is the, or the answer is never coming out of nowhere. And in that sense, we can see that the banking system calls the mainframe system always. And that could be TCP and it's bidirectional by nature, but the intention is one directional. It's only going in that direction. If the mainframe is starting autonomously a connection, I could draw a second arrow and represent that with a different label. Be explicit about the purpose of the, of the lines and the directions. Uh, databases, classic. Of course, the data resides in the database, but the database will never push data into something. Something will query pull data from the database. So there's an arrow to the database, never from the database, right? The databases are, are sinks of information, they're not uh, fountains of information. And one thing that's also important in, in this simple notation is to use coloring in, 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 a, in a consistent way. I like to use blue to then demonstrate the things that are in scope and gray for all those that are out of scope. And that's that's basically all I have to say to 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 the diagramming. Now I would like to ask you to um, to try try this out once. Um, there's the 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 mirror board that um, Shuning just um, shared. Thank you, Shuning. Shuning. Um, so basically, there's two small exercises. Uh, some of the work has already been done. 
And the idea is um, there's a there's a case description. I will go through it right away, but you can start logging in and, and looking a bit on uh, on the on the on the mirror board. The idea is to create a context diagram of of the system of uh, the target of evaluation. Identify actors, third party systems, label them, label the connections, and then go a bit deeper. I created a something that could work, but it needs some some love. It needs some work. So the idea was to just give you enough time or or a chance to finish in within ten to fifteen minutes. Um, identify technology choices, uh, how information flows to the system, so that we can start actually doing the threat modeling part of the analysis and mitigation phase in the next exercise. So we will be discussing something that has no AI to make it easy to get started. So the, the target of analysis is the pet store. The pet store is a classical example of AWS. There's a lot of examples of AWS uh, pet store. And I've taken it, modified it a little bit and say, okay, I am a startup. I am the owner of a startup or a member of a startup selling a software as a service solution to veterinarians, pet stores uh, to help them have an online presence. If you can think of uh, Etsy and know what Etsy is, basically that's what we want to do with uh, pet shops. We want to give them a platform where they can reach customers. And for that, obviously we have a business to business connection with the pet shop owners, they can register their shop. They will get a subdomain of the form um, something something.superpets.com. We are superpets.com. They can customize their shop. They can add colors, images, whatever they want. They can announce their services and specialties. They can use, um, there's a third party platform for payment that we have incorporated. They can use it. They can manage their employees and appointments. They can send coupons, promotions, and reminders to their customers, and they can respond to reviews. Obviously, if we are offering them this possibility, we are also offering to the pet shop, to the pet owners themselves, the possibility to sign up to superpets.com, look for stores and select one in their area, register their pet, upload an image of their pet, manage appointments, leave reviews for the pet shop and pay online using the third party provider. So with that said, uh, it's time to uh, go to the breakout rooms. Um, I think on the mirror board, shall I share the mirror board as well? Yeah, the mirror board is also in the chat. So we share the, sh the use case and the mirror board with the password for the mirror board being hackathon. And I am going to create 13 rooms. This time I will let you pick the room based on your team ID instead of me trying to assign all of you. Um, so Luis, is there any other things you want to announce before we send folks into the rooms? The no? instructions have been copied into Miro. So you will find the description I just made of the system there. You will find the instructions for the, for the two parts of this exercise. And I'll see you in, what, uh, 10 minutes? 15 minutes? What do you say, Shirin? About 10 minutes, yep. 10 awesome. minutes. Let's see All if right. you can finish. All right? Okay. So again, this is one solution. It's not the solution, but it's the solution I, I came up with in, in, my, in my head. So I have the pet store based on what I know from the, from the use case. I have pet owners and pet store owners. I have a payment provider. But the one group that was never mentioned, but which must exist, is operations, developers, admins, uh, admins of the platform, not necessarily the admins of the of the VMs or whatever we're running, and maybe support personnel. So I I painted them here uh, on the lower side just just for completeness. The idea again being, what are we trying to do? Who is interacting with us? How much trust and how do I establish trust with these other entities? So the idea behind the context diagram is to be able to understand who am I interacting with or who my system is inter interacting with and how is trust established 
between these systems or between these actors and interactors. Of course, uh, the time was not enough. Uh, we have a very strict schedule to, 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 to keep up and uh, we're running out of time. So um, there, there was unfortunately not the chance to, to work further, uh, to, to give you more time to work on this. And on the container diagram, what you will see is that I created one that responds to the pet owner. I did not create a container diagram that processed the pet store owner or the employee's uh, workflows. And what I'm trying to, to show you here is one way to go around these diagrams that grow in size enormously and are very confusing to follow is to create different aspects of it, maybe create different container diagrams that allow you to, to represent different aspects of your system uh, for different stakeholders. So in this case, for example, the pet owner could download a React or single page application from CloudFront, which is hosted in, in an S3 bucket, it would then try to connect through the API gateway and every request could be authorized in the policy database. So basically mimicking uh, what OPA, the open policy agent is doing. And of course, if you're not authorized, you have to be redirected to the identity provider, Cognito in this case. And then only after you have been authorized and uh, well authenticated and authorized you may get access to the Lambda providing you a service. And obviously there will not be one Lambda, but several Lambdas running. Is this the way this application is supposed to be running? It could be. It could also be running on Kubernetes. It could be running on a VM. This is just the way I envision this to be running in my own exercise, in my own kata. Your, own, your kata might look different from my kata. And if I look at the pet store owner, there might be some elements that are the same. There might be some elements that are different because there will be a calendar function. There will be some other things that the pet owner doesn't have. And my own employees will definitely have to include the, the underlying infrastructure, how to access this uh, just in time, et cetera. Uh, access for privilege management, databases, access to the databases, key stores, logging and monitoring. So there's a lot of things that were not included in this container diagram, but there are I would create different container diagrams for these different uh, aspects of the infrastructure that are different. Um, the stencils for, for the C4 model notation, um, I mean, the, the easiest thing is just take a block in Miro and uh, create one line Give, give it the title and create different. Else, if you use the Draw.io plugin, there's a stencil for C4 model. So um, Draw.io has a stencil for um, C4 model. Else, um, take a look at um, c4model.com. If you take a look at that website, um, Simon Brown, the creator of this methodology, has a lot of links to his own products or um, Draw.io and who, who, uh, whichever stencils they use. I personally draw a lot more with GraphBiz, which is a um, um, diagrams as code, because I like to keep my diagrams close to the code, which increases the probability of them being maintained. Um, I think even Mermaid has uh, C4 stencils. So if you know Mermaid, you can create them in Mermaid as well. Any other questions? Um, either in the chat or uh, speak in. Plant UML. Plant UML has uh, C4 model stencils. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Prasanna. All right. So let's go to the next uh, part of threat modeling. So we have a diagram or a set of diagrams which allow us to understand what we're actually discussing, which allow us to have a meaningful discussion with the developers, the operators, to understand what they're building and their thoughts around it. 
One thing I usually ask for are architectural decision records. Many times the teams don't have them, but it's basic hygiene in system development. Why did you choose to do things this way rather than this other way in, a, in an infinite number of possibilities uh, for decisions? It's interesting to understand the, the rationale behind the specific way of doing things or different product choices. Back in the day before Adam Shostak created the book on the right-hand side, there was this thing. And that's the first mention of threat modeling that I could uh, find in, in the reference. So that, at least that was the ones I had in my at my disposal uh, before Shosta came out with this one, Adam came out with this one. And it was really hard to use. And when Adam came out with his, it was, it was nice. You had a very comprehensive libraries of threats for uh, spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service and elevation of privilege, which is the abbreviation of stride in case you didn't know it. But the biggest challenge I found was it felt incomplete and it, I, it felt very difficult to use if, if you didn't know if it was applicable. I remember having a session with the physical cards for elevation of privilege. And I just gave them out in the room and I was motivating my colleagues to, to participate and say something. And then they, come, they had the ACE and they said, oh, ACE, 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 I invent a new tampering methodology. Oh, fantastic. What's your tampering methodology that you invented? I don't know. That's what the card says. So we need to be careful on, on how we apply it, right? And I'm, I'm, I will try to help you a bit uh, better. Uh, I will try to help you to apply it in a more productive way. And one of the reasons I say stride is not threat modeling is that around the same time, or actually a lot before. Adam Shostak came out with his book, Gary McGraw came out with his, and he described what we call threat modeling today as architectural risk analysis. And you will find in the Berryville machine learning um, document that it's called actually an architectural risk analysis of machine learning systems. Gary never gave up his definition uh, for, for threat modeling because he didn't think that we were threat modeling. He, he believes that we were doing architectural risk analysis. And I'm a bit more on that fraction of the, of the argument. Um, Brooke Schoenfeld uh, was, um, is one of the judges. He created this book. In this book, he describes his um, methodology called uh, ATASM, Architecture, Threats, Attack Surface, and Mitigation, which is very similar to, to Macross. Um, bit philosophical discussion if you want, but the important thing here is threat modeling does not exist by and of itself. Threat modeling is usually part, the seed of many threats, many risks in risk management. And in the context of, in the context of risk management, we start always with the asset. The asset has value. And because the asset has value, the more value the asset has, the more important the asset is to the organization, the higher the risk, the impact of the system failing or being abused. On the, other, on the other hand side, if an asset has a negative characteristic, an intrinsic characteristic otherwise known as vulnerability, it also increases risk. Now, when we determine that we have increased risk, Usually we have policies that try to cover the common things out of, uh, out of this. And what the policies mandate are controls. And these controls try to do one of two things. Either they, they help us detect, respond, or recover from threat scenarios, or they help us prevent vulnerabilities. And you will see I have added here the threat agent. Threat agents, you cannot really get that way. You cannot really get them away. No matter what you do, there will always be script kiddies, there will always be APTs, there will always be motivated actors and whoever. There are libraries for threat agents. 
there are libraries for threat scenarios we could add to this list OWASP uh, machine learning uh, top 10. We could ask, add uh, to this list uh, Barry Build machine learning um, th threat catalog from, from Macron and his friends. And the, uh, the question here is, we see that for both threat agents and threat scenarios, there's a lot of help. Now, what or who helps us find vulnerabilities? How do you identify vulnerabilities in a system so that you know that there is a bridge between the threat scenario and the vulnerability? Coming back to the example that I was giving before, when I was in this room and my colleagues were just lifting a card and trying to apply it, they were throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing if it sticks. And the only way for a threat to be valid is if, the, if there is a vulnerability that can be exploited. If you do not have a vulnerability, I can, if, if, if I have used a memory safe language, there is no way I can do uh, buffer overflows. It's not possible in the language, for, uh, to name an example. Or if I'm using object relational mapping, I really have to go out of my way to enable SQL injection attacks. SQL injection is the attack, the vulnerability being the confusion of data and uh, control instructions for the database query. Now, threat libraries will help us identify threat scenarios. And I have added to the slides uh, links to two of them. So there's elevation of privilege from Shostak. There's elevation of MLSEC from Katenga. I, I found that uh, was very intriguing and uh, very current for, for machine learning. There's always Linden for privacy. So if, if for the purpose of the, of the hackathon, I would advise you to look at these three threat libraries. But how do you know if the system you're analyzing is vulnerable? I know this is kind of uh, uh, full of information. The idea here is security principles are what will allow you to identify things that can go wrong with the system. Some of them were coined in 1975. I wasn't even born, born when these were, terms were coined. Many of you might have not even been, your parents might not, have not even met in 1975, right? It's the beginning of the computing era. So they, they came up with keep it simple, make it safe by default, authorization decisions need to be uh, always be checked before execution. Your design shouldn't be a secret. Security by obscurity shouldn't be the thing that keeps you safe. Separation of privilege, least privilege, least common mechanism, hello environment variables in Docker, with uh, secrets and consider your users, psychological acceptability. These were taken in 2013 by, um, I think, Brooke Schoenfeld, Gary Macron, a few other friends, and recoined. Um, and I have found that the combination of these security principles allow me to understand where vulnerabilities are present and allow me to come up a lot faster with things that could go wrong. And one way to be able to sell what can go wrong is to create credible attack vectors. I have seen a lot of times or discussed a lot of times uh, attack vectors uh, attack vectors that say basically um, developers can make errors and their SQL injection. Well, try selling that to a developer. It will not fly. So the best thing is to say, okay, I have a vulnerability that is exposed. Somehow it comes in contact with someone that will exploit it somehow. And if we can at least get the somehow and the what will be exploited, and the damage, the outcome of it in a logical sentence, that will help a lot. So um, 
coming back to the to the diagram that I had, oh oh god, I closed everything. <laughs> okay, sorry, 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 sorry. I was trying to make it fast. Now I don't have it. Give me one second to reshare my screen. Sorry for that. Almost done. We can go to the exercise in two minutes, in one minute. So the credible attack vector basically envelopes. Am I sharing? Sorry. I don't see the. Uh, not yet. Oh, of course not. Yeah, no. Now it should be sharing. Sorry for that um, blip in the, in the, in the system. So. Basically, what I'm trying to say is if you package this thing into the description of what you're trying to sell the developers to fix, it will be a lot easier to fix it. And if you package it in a way that they understand it, even more. I'm not sure if you have ever heard of Gherkin. It's the way to describe um, a lot of development in the Agile world is it's used uh, with Gherkin. And it basically consists of three elements. Given preconditions, your vulnerability, for example, when the threat scenario occurs, then these are the consequences. This is extremely logical. It doesn't take a lot of time to write it, and it helps to understand it a lot better. So the exercise right now is based on, on, the, on the scenarios, that on the diagrams that you created already. Um, create one or two credible attack vectors on the high level scenario, attack the business case. Very often we are so laser focused on connections between systems that we forget that the system exists for a business purpose. For example, uh, coupons. Coupons are incredibly open for attack if you don't think of it through. It's not an implementation thing, it's a conceptual thing. What is the, the correct usage of the coupon, for example. Um, on the handout that Shonen has um, linked in, in the chat, you will find a list of the elevation of privilege threat scenarios. Take one or two and try to apply them and fill out a table. So basically what you will find is a table and uh, uh, what we are asking of you is to write two or three scenarios, two or three credible attack vectors, and I will just show you a very quick example, and then we can go go to the to the um, to the rooms. And uh, so, tampering example: an attacker can modify your build system and produce signed builds of your software. How do you know if this applies? I need a vulnerability. What's my vulnerability? I have an internet-facing build system with default admin credentials. I have unsigned commits. I am not. Uh, forcing merge requests when pushing to the main branch. I am not using MFA for uh, developer login. Taking a look at just one of them, for example, given the build system is internet facing and has default admin credentials, when an adversary abuses these credentials, then changes can be introduced to the build pipelines and no one will notice. How do I fix this? Force MFA, uh, rotate secrets every now and then, and if possible, don't make it internet facing or uh, restrict admin access to require uh, a jump host or something else. So with that said, uh, let's go to the exercise. Uh, let's jump into the breakout rooms and uh, just come up with two or three maybe credible attack vectors, one on the business case level and one or two based on the attack libraries. Awesome. Thank you, Louis. So just a quick announcement before we send everyone to the big breakout room. I reassigned some of you um, since you know you might be the only one from your team that will be joining. So some of you may be uh, entering the common room, room from room 30 to room 32 or 33, oh, just so you know. Awesome. So we'll see everyone back in about eight minutes. Um, so uh, if you need more inspiration, I have done a few more katas in the past. You can find them on my GitHub repo, or uh, I have done them in the context of the Open Security Summit. There's videos to the katas. There's four katas that have been created, so you can look at the video and or the, the repo. 
Um, I also participated last year in the hackathon. You can see my my write up and the diagrams I created on the on the, on this other um, GitHub repo. I'll um, share a, um, the the slides, so there's no need for you to to write that down right now. Um, I mean, if you go to GitHub.com LF Serbian, you you can find them, anyways. But that's um, that's that's just uh, the the what I, what I have to share right now. Thank you very much for being here. I hope it um, helped you um, um, sharpen your skills. I know the time was very limited. Unfortunately, we don't have more more time, and and to be able to do this longer, we would need at least twice the amount of time. Uh, but uh, it's it's good enough to to get started. Uh, if you have any questions. Um, I'll be around, ask them on Slack. I'll be uh, participating a lot during these days. Um, besides from that, um, before before we run out of time, do you have any questions, any comments, anything you would like to understand better? I think, Lewis, just to be clear, you're not saying this is the way to do it, but you're saying this is a way to do it, right? It is exactly that. This is a way to do it. This is not the way. This is a way at which I have arrived after over a decade of threat modeling and teaching threat modeling to a lot of people.